Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is representation theory. Today I would like to tell you about a very, very famous theorem, uh, Burnside theorem, um, and how Burnside proved it using representation theory. I will tell you the story, or at least how I understand the story. And then I explain what this theorem is. I won't quite explain the proof. It's a bit harder um, than just that it fits on one slide, but it's not so hard. And it uses representation theory in a crucial way. It's really about a statement in group theory, which is proven using representation theory. So it's actually a cool application if you want. Uh, well, it's an application. Whether it's cool, I let you decide whether it's cool or not. It's an application of representation theory. So the history is roughly as follows. So there's Burnside's famous book, The Theory of Groups of Finite Order, um, which first appeared oh, pff, about 125 years ago or so, um, 1897. And basically, I will read it in a second. Basically, Burnside says representation theory is useless. So that's the first part. I will read it in a second. And then a little bit later, so 1911, there was a revision of the book. And Burnside basically said representation theory is amazing. We'll read it out in a second. And what was in between is this, well, not just that Burnside decided that, well, it's a good idea to just study representation theory, be one of the pioneers of representation theory, but also to prove this famous theorem, Burnside theorem, which is a purely group theoretical theorem that I'm going to explain in this video using representation theory. And this just completely changed kind of the, the, the minds of people. Like um, from that's pretty much useless kind of Frobenius and Frobenius' students did it basically uh, alone. And then a lot of people jumped on the strain because it's just so powerful. So let me read it out. So here in the first edition, it would be difficult to find a result that could be most directly obtained by the consideration of groups of linear transformations. So linear transformation, um, the old word of represent for representations so basically, this says it's useless, right? It would be most difficult to find a result, blah, 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 blah. It's just a nice way of saying, uh, I think it's useless. And then um, it changed, it completely changed. So uh, blah, 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 groups of linear substitutions, as I said, representations, has been the subject of numerous and important investigations by several writers, including Burnside, of course. Well, and in fact, it's now more true to say that for further advances in the abstract theory of groups, one must most one must look largely to the representation of a group as a group of linear substitutions. So, one, in order to uh, advance group theory further, one basically needs to study representation theory. So, uh, from representation theory is useless to representation theory is amazing. That's quite a, quite a change of mind. And in between was this famous Burnside's proof of uh, Burnside theorem. So, and a rep theory proof of a purely group theoretical theorem. So I'm not, not going to motivate the theorem, but I find this very impressive. This like I, I completely changed my mind. And actually, from this is very useless to I will be one of the pioneers of the theory. That's how it sometimes goes. Very nice, uh, very nice historical remark. Okay, so the kind of the point is that I tried to motivate a long time ago uh, that simple representations are like simple groups. The simple groups are the elements of group theory, simple representations are the elements of representation theory, and the elements are the elements of chemistry. So really what group theorists like to do is to, to kind of classify the elements to write down the periodic table, in this case to kind of find uh, the finite simple groups. So it's really want to do restriction on finite, otherwise it gets a bit messy, but it's sort of kind of a good question uh, to try to find the finite simple groups. It's a not trivial question to list them, but the answer is known. It's one of the greatest achievements in mathematics, but let's not worry about details. Let's just go from Burnside's point of view here, uh, which is certainly a bit outdated and I can't even blame Burnside for that. It's 100 whatever years ago. Anyway, so it seems to be a good problem and you would start with easy examples. For example, it's not really hard to see that a group of prime order um, is simple only if it's a prime is just, well, it's just K is just one uh, or zero, okay? The trivial group is also simple. I kind of ignore that case. So, and if it's one, then it's just Z mod P. So um, whenever the order of the group is just divisible by one prime, so in this case P to the K, it's kind of an easy question. And then Burnside just asked the next natural question, what happens for more than one prime factor? So what happens if the group has now two or three or four prime factors? Can we somehow decide in some easy way whether this group is simple or not? Um, turns out, and 
this table that I'm presenting here to you was basically known to Burnside, I guess. Uh, but anyway, uh, so if you list the finite groups, the finite simple groups of small orders, um, you already don't really care about the abelian ones. They're always of this form anyway. So let's list the non-abelian ones. And the smallest one you find is actually already pretty big. It's of order 60. So it's a, um, the A5, the alternating group in five elements. And it's of this order. So two times two times three times five. In particular, has three prime factors. Uh, it's kind of fun, right? So you, you don't see any two prime factor groups here. They all have three or pr four prime factors even. And if you continue this list, um, whatever, to do the first one million or whatever, you won't find anything with two prime factors. So you might conjecture, uh, that's what Burnside conjectures a long time ago, that all, well, again, abelian groups are boring, we take them out, all non-abelian finite simple groups have at least three prime factors. So you have at least something like two times three times five or seven times 11 times 13, something like that. And you never have uh, a group of order five times seven to be simple. That's not obvious why this should be true. And this is known as, um, well, Burnside's P to the A, Q to the B theorem. Or I think, well, we'll see it down here. Actually, Burnside, the Burnside themselves, as you can see here, used alpha and beta and not A and B. Uh, for me, typesetting A and B, it's actually not much harder to typeset alpha and beta than A and B, but I was, I don't know. I like A and B more. Anyway, let's ignore that. So you, you look at groups of order P to the A and Q to the B, and of course, P and Q are primes and A and B are some natural numbers. And Burnside theorem basically says that those groups are not simple. You can make a slightly stronger statement, which is called solvability, but we can ignore this for uh, this video. So um, basically the statement is the groups of those orders are not simple. In particular, you need at least three prime factors to find a simple group. And you know for three prime factors, you will find a non-abelian simple group, the alternating group from my previous slide. And Burnside proved it using representation theory and it was really in between the two versions of the book. So the first version was here, the second version was here, and basically in between 1904, that's almost precisely in between, but it doesn't really matter. So 1904, Burnside published this famous paper using representation theory to prove this purely group theoretical statement. And it took about 70 years, um, so this is from 1970 here, to find a group theoretical proof. And this is really 70 years. So this is the version here that I've listed is for odd primes. I have the, uh, in the link down uh, in the description where you can find the paper that does it in general. I took two years more. So it's really roughly 70 years. So let me just say 70 years. So it took about 70 years to find a proof without representation theory. And not because this was a problem that was ignored by most people. just because the purely group theoretical proof is much harder. Um, it's a little bit unsatisfactory for a group theorist if you need to use a different theory to prove a theorem within your own theory. And in particular, if the theory itself is, in some sense, much more sophisticated than group theory itself. So with representation theory, you can cook up a reasonably easy proof. I will kind of sketch it in a second. Um, not Burnside's original one, but the one uh, linked in the description. So in the book, in the description, Steinbeck's book, uh, Representation Theory of Finite Book. Uh, groups, a very nice proof. Um, and it's not so hard. And the, while you can have a look at those papers, the proof using group theory is also not very hard, but um, much smarter in some sense. It's less straightforward. And that's probably why it took so long, like 70 years to find a non-representation theoretical proof of a purely group theoretical statement. So without going too much into details, there is some technical theorem, which I won't read out all that much. Well, and then you have a slightly technical lemma. That's basically what you need. So the technical lemma says the following. So if you have a, a finite non-abelian group and you use the theorem to prove the lemma, I'm not going into details what the theorem is, um, you have a finite non-abelian group and you have a conjugacy clause of order P to the T for some prime, um, then G is not simple. So and then what you do is, um, what you do is you assume that your order, the group has two different prime factors by kind of a version of Silo's theorem, you find a group, well, let's say that it's of course P to the A, Q to the B, you find a certain subgroup of order Q to the B and the existence of the subgroup 
implies the existence of the kind of the conjugate conjugacy class, the, conjugate, the orthogonal conjugacy class, whatever you want to call it, of a prime power p, and then just you're done by the lemma. It's really not so hard. Basically, you play a little bit around with uh, pseudo theorems, which most people, well, it was definitely well, pseudo theorems were definitely already well known to Burnside. And most beginner classes on algebra usually should cover those theorems. So it's not so hard actually to come up with a proof if you know a little bit about representation theory and representation theory enters through uh, this theorem because there is they really play around with simple representations in the theorem. I, I don't want to go too much into details what this theorem says. Anyway, so this is kind of cool history. I, I really like this kind of history, like Burnside completely changed their mind from I don't like representation theory. I think it's useless to, oh, it's the best, the best error, the best in the world. Um, and there's kind of some really cool applications of representation theory. So here, Burnside theorem, a purely group theoretical statement with a uh, representation theoretical proof. As I said, the representation theoretical proof is a bit too hard for one slide. So it's a bit too hard for a video. It's not super hard, um, but it's a bit too hard. And Burnside did it. And it took 70 years to find a proof without representation theory, which is pretty impressive, I think. Shows you some of the power of representation theory. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.